So I'm going to do something a little unusual here. Usually, the way these things work, you, you come in and you sit down and they tell everybody to turn off their phones. Turn off your phones. Um, I'd like everyone to just take your phone out. Just for a second, actually take it out and, uh, and turn it on, OK? <laughs> now, the first thing that happens when you turn on your phone is that it's contacted by what's called a cell base station or a cell tower. And we all know that, but um, a lot of people don't know that that cell base station also starts contacting other cell base stations that are around. And you can probably see a few of them from this window. And they engage in a really big conversation about which cell base station is the best one to provide your phone with service based on where they think you are and where they think you're going. So it's a big conversation between a bunch of machines about you that you can't hear. Now, some of you can put your phones away, but if you have a smartphone with GPS, leave it out and, and hold it up so we can see how many people that is. OK. <laughs> it is all of you. Um, <laughs> this is hilarious. So right now, smartphone penetration in the United States is 57% in a TEDx event outside of Washington, DC. It appears to be 100%. <laughs> I usually leave the uh, GPS on my phone off to preserve battery life, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it on. And as I do this, I want everyone to be just really quiet for a second and see if you hear anything unusual. Okay. Nothing, right? But in the milliseconds after I turned on my GPS, uh, my phone was contacted by the Global Positioning System, a network of satellites, and they began trading signals as well. So I think this is miraculous that we live in an age where you can walk into a room and everybody in that room is going to be carrying a device that's constantly talking about them to other devices and communicating with space. And we are so accustomed to this that we don't think to ask what our machines are saying about us. So we make a lot of this data. As citizens of the 21st century, you create much more data than any generation of humanity that has ever come before you. With your email, your video, music, and movie streaming particularly, you create <coughs> 1.8 million megabytes of data on a yearly basis. It's enough to fill like nine CD-ROMs a day. Now, very little of it, only about 10% is ever stored permanently, and you interact with very little of it directly. But all of it says something about you. <laughs> That's what happens when you tell people to turn on their phones. <laughs> so you are big data. We've heard this expression tossed around a lot lately. Um, it's not always well defined. Let's define it right now. It's you. It's 65 billion location tag payments that happen annually in the United States. It's all the email you send. It's all these digital interactions that we were just talking about. You are big data, and that is the reason why 90% of all the data that uh, the world has ever generated has been generated in just the last two years. Now, you can't talk about this issue without also talking about privacy. Um, and there have been some great reports lately from uh, The Guardian, also The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, ProPublica, talking about the um, uh, privacy implications of the fact that we all carry around devices that are constantly talking about us in a way we can't hear. And that's vitally important, but that's not what I want to talk to you about today. Because I would like to suggest to you that our current conversation about privacy reflects an unfortunate but also temporary and curable state. We feel we are at the mercy of devices that communicate in a language we cannot hear to parties we cannot see. And the crazy thing I'd like to convince you of is that the solution to that is not to go back to a period where we're creating less information, where we don't create information through everything that we do, but where we actually share more information. I know, it's crazy. I spent the last year of my life on a really interesting editorial project talking to researchers around the world who have figured out how to listen to some of these signals that um, we just talked about, how to use them for new purposes. And uh, uh, I've come across some really remarkable insights, and I'm just going to share a couple of them with you right now. Um, Case in point, raise your hand if you believe you know with 80% certainty or higher where you are going to be physically in a room, you know, two block by two block radius 
80 weeks from right now. It's about a year and a half in the future. You know exactly where you're going to be a year and a half in the future from 1140. Nobody, right? Turns out the answer to this question is contained in the record of what your devices have been saying about you. It's accessible to some people. Um, two researchers, John Croom from Microsoft and Adam Sedelic from the University of Rochester, uh, went out to figure out how well they could predict a person's future location based on data that they were creating. John Croom had this really amazing data set. He uh, just found a whole bunch of people and he paid them money to carry around a GPS receiver, not at all unlike the one in your phone, and he watched them for a really long time. <laughs> And he found that with 3,200 days of this GPS data using Adam Sedelic's formula, they could predict someone's future location 80 weeks in advance with higher than 80% certainty. Now, when we talk about someone else knowing where you are going to be 80 weeks into the future, we're talking about a dystopian surveillance state that we all hate. When we talk about your ability to do it for yourself, it's a superpower. It's a small change that makes a big difference, right? What would you do with that superpower? What else could you do with it? Well, what if you could combine it with information that other people are giving out publicly and you could say, avoid meeting someone that you didn't want to meet? What if you wanted to uh, predict future people that you would want to avoid? Um, imagine getting a push notification on your phone that said this, that would tell you the probability of catching a specific person's flu later today. You have a 50% chance of getting Tom's cold tonight. Is this possible? Yes. When you consider what your information reveals in the context of other people's information. So Adam Sedelic, uh, again, used a data set of geotagged tweets from two Johns Hopkins researchers. And um, using this set is from uh, about 6,000 New Yorkers, he was able to predict 18% um, of the person-to-person -person flu transmissions that occurred between these New Yorkers over a period of one month. And when you consider the enormous number of variables that go into predicting the person that's going to give you a cold, 18% is miraculous, and it would go up if there were a lot more people who geotagged their tweets. Now, um, these aren't your typical New Yorkers. These are people who are willing to share a lot of information about themselves publicly, where they go, who they've been with, and how they feel. Uh, but um, this is probably something that you're thinking to yourself, that's too, too much information, right? I don't want to share that information with that many people because as soon as I do that, the first thing that's going to happen is that a bunch of companies are going to target me with like aggressive mobile advertising, and that's not what I want, and they're going to try to trick me into buying stuff that I don't really need, and I'm here to tell you that's going to happen, okay? Um, you don't have to be like a brilliant futurist to know that we're all going to be faced with much more aggressive and effective mobile advertising. What if we're actually giving away information into our phones that we can use to protect ourselves from highly coercive mobile marketing? What if you answered a push notification on your phone that told you <laughs> that you have a 60% probability of regretting a purchase that you're about to make. This is like the <laughs> antidote to advertising, right? <laughs> you make this information right now, and for the first time in history, it's collectible and usable. Um, there's a company, a fantastic company, called TickTrack, uh, started by a guy named Martin Blender. And um, what it does is it lets you take all the data streams that you make that you can collect, uh, your email, your calendar, um, if you use a fitness system like Nike Plus or Fitbit, if you happen to have an experimental cybernetic implant implanted in you, <laughs> um, your uh, Amazon purchases, your Yelp reviews, you can combine all of those so that you can see how all of these different data streams that represent your life interact. So you can see how pushing all of your emailing to the end of the day affects your stress level, how your interactions with one particular individual affects your drinking, <laughs> um, how your, ex your exercise affects your electricity bill, right? This is also a superpower. 
It's one that's waiting for us. If we can learn to understand the signals that we're giving away to our phone. We're giving away information all the time that could actually help us be better people if we could learn to listen to it. Um, we could be better partners, better friends, better lovers, better husbands. So um, sidebar, I'm married and I'm married to this incredibly amazing woman. She's super smart. She um, is getting a PhD from an Ivy League school in a really difficult field. She speaks languages that a few years ago I didn't know actually existed. <laughs> she's, uh, she's brilliant. Despite this, I am not always the most attentive or engaged conversationalist. <laughs> I know, I too am shocked. <laughs> The problem is that I'm a man, okay? <laughs> so I can't pay attention to when I'm not paying attention because I'm not paying attention. <laughs> but the, the secret uh, that will help me edit and change that behavior is also potentially available in information that I'm giving away to my phone. There's a researcher at MIT named Sandy Pentland and he argues that um, the way in which we communicate, the way in which we approach an interaction is as deterministic of how that interaction is going to unfold as the content of our communication. So if I stand here before you today and I speak in an even tone, perhaps a bit patronizing, and if you attempt to interrupt me, I don't let you, and I carry on like this without using my hands for a long period of time, this is telling you a particular role I'm going to take in my interaction with you. And if conversely, I use my hands a lot and I speak really fast and my voice goes up and down, this also suggests a role I'm going to take in my interaction with you. And if I just stand and look at you, I'm also telling you what I want out of the interaction with you, if I want to sort of bully you into a position, if I'm interested in exploring a possibility with you, if I just am going to listen to you. This signaling tells you all of that, regardless of what's literally coming out of my mouth. So Sandy Pentland wanted to figure out if he could actually collect some of this data on these hidden signals. And he made a machine, he just hacked a machine called a sociometer. It sounds fancy, but it's a lot like your phone. Uh, like your phone's accelerometer chip. It had, uh, uh, it was capable of measuring gesture, and like your phone's microphone, it could pick up voice. And what he found was that with just 30 seconds of this sociometer data, he could predict how a given interaction was going to play out. If it was a business negotiation, he could predict which side was going to win. If it was a romantic encounter and the prize on the table was someone's phone number, he could predict if the phone number would be exchanged or if the parties, the two people would part and go their separate ways. So his partner in this experimentation, a researcher named Anmol Madan, actually created a program called a jerkometer, which sort of functions like this. <laughs> It's just, it would just give you a little notice that, was, that would tell you that you're about to be a jerk, okay? I, I would find this program extremely useful. <laughs> All right, so to sum up, we've reached an age where we create information in everything that we do. But instead of feeling empowered by that, we feel uh, unempowered. And that's a problem, and the solution to that is to understand first and foremost that your digital interactions, the information that you create, the places you go, the people you see, and the things that you say, they belong to you first and foremost. And so the first step is to begin to understand and actually listen to some of the data that we create that's available around us all the time. And if we can do that, then the spectrum of our human experience will expand beyond what we ever thought possible. Thank you. <laughs>